Hello everyone, my name is Tanchal Sharma. On behalf of CORE, welcome you all to the webinar on Integrating Local Personal Response and Recovery Capacity. We have with us Dr. Stephen Hens, who is an Assistant Professor of Practice and the Director of the Risk Management and Insurance Program at the University of Texas of Dallas. Stephen is an experienced practitioner with over a decade of business continuity and disaster risk management experience. And he served proudly in the US Navy. Welcome Dr. Steven and over to you. All right, well, thank you so very much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Good morning or good evening, I guess is uh, the more appropriate terminology for everyone uh, in India today. Uh, I am uh, Professor Stephen Haynes and I'm going to share with you all today kind of the experience I had um, as a practitioner um, that led to um, a very uh, pivoting moment in my life. Uh, to begin with though, I kind of have to give you a little bit of background here. So before I came um, to academia, I was a practitioner. Uh, I was a risk management uh, business continuity person. Um, spent most of my career um, working with companies specifically trying to help them mitigate um, against losses and things of that nature. Um, but I kind of noticed something as I was going along um, that many times when we talk about risk, we generally talk about risk in some idea that there's a hazard, right? Like something either natural or human made type of issue. Um, and then it, you know, equals this idea of an occurrence in severity. And, you know, when I look at that model, one of the things I kind of realize is that it's very, very passive. It assumes that we don't have a lot of opportunity to um, pivot, to adjust, um, to be able to detect and mitigate, right? Um, risk is by its purest nature and form, is this idea that something uh, bad can happen um, with some type of consequence, right? Right. Now, I kind of took this idea and I, I ended up um, running this program uh, across 400 organizations in the United States. Um, and one of the things I found is that we actually have um, the opportunity to respond pretty effectively. People are not going to just sit back and let bad things happen to them. Uh, and in fact, we can um, pivot in what I will call adaptive capacity um, in, in or absorption capacity is kind of the two things that kind of come out of this. Um, because ultimately, we want to be resilient. Now, this model that I'm sharing with you, um, there is a paper that I published that has the model in there and it has all of the data um, that tells you how to do the model. Um, uh, I think I shared it with the organizer, so you might be able to, to download it. Now, with that being said, I do want to point out that there are these different outcomes, right? You can have an operational outcome which means that you could end up losing your full operations or you could have a limited operational outcome, um, right, um, or a shutdown. And when I said full, you could have full operations, nothing was impacted. I'm sorry, I misspoke, but full operations means nothing's been impacted. You could have limited operations or you could have complete shutdown. Um, now, with employees, employees can be working their normal job or you could have some type of modified condition where they're working maybe part-time or maybe they're doing something different or you have to do layoffs and and I'll talk a little bit about layoffs uh, later and then customers you could have your normal customers or limited number of customers you can serve or you can have no customers at all right those are the outcomes that we're trying to identify um, as we look through this and I'll, I'll share more here 
when we talk about hazards, there's pretty much six types of hazards, right? And I think that everyone here probably has an idea of the hazards that are going to impact them, right? I mean, maybe it's typhoon, maybe it's 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 flooding from the monsoon season, maybe um, it's groundwater depletion causing um, ground shifting, right? We we definitely have seen that uh, showing up more and more uh, across the world. Um, but there's other issues we can we can certainly talk. We can talk about the cyber uh, incidents, right? And, you know, with everything going on in Ukraine right now, um, cyber warfare is something that's very, very near and dear to a lot of the conversation right now. Um, so as we're looking at these hazards, the first thing we have to do is we have to put all these hazards. The deal with the probability is how long do you look? How long should we consider um examining the probability of something happen. You know, we did a study uh, a couple of years ago that showed that on average, a publicly traded company um, only survives about 30 years. Now that used to be about 37 years um, before 2000s and in 2000s publicly traded companies began dying off. So maybe our timeline should be 30 years. But I'm going to go ahead and warn you that for most companies that are not publicly traded, really we need to be looking at a 10-year time scale. A 10-year time scale is the average tenure of a non-publicly traded company's survival. With that being said, you know, we should identify those things that are likely to happen you know, and start considering that as versus using a 100-year or a 500-year timeline. You know, once we get past that, we start looking at this idea of you know, what are the things that are going to happen in terms of severity to our company? And I will tell you with looking at all the information, there are five things that tremendously impact the severity of an organization. First being the facility. We can definitely talk about the facility. We can talk about how, you know, the loss of the facility is, you know, very detrimental to the organization. But what happens when you have a facility? right? Water um, is one of the most important things any facility can have, right? If you don't have water, you really can't have an organized operational facility. At least in the United States, we have a, a code requirement that requires you to have fresh water before anyone's allowed in the building, you know? Um, but another thing is infrastructure. What about it when you don't have access to the IT uh, side of the house? Or maybe you don't have access to um, uh, maybe like gases for controlled processes and, and, and manufacturing. Uh, the other two issues are less directly impacted by the organization, but it's more about the people within the organization. The first one is evacuation. When people have to evacuate, it does take time to return to the area. And sometimes it can create long returns, right? For instance, uh, in the United States, if people have to evacuate for a hurricane, um, that hurt certainly take some time before they can come, uh, before they can get back, right? Uh, we got to wait for the event to happen and then to return. And making something safe to return is a priority for organizations. And finally, transportation. Um, many times when we look at transportation, we just assume that people are going to be able to get to your organization. Um, but many times when we have significant disrupting event, events, um, the major highways or the major roads may not be able to be passed. I can tell you from my experience that a lot of times major highways become staging grounds for materials coming in. So sometimes you can't get through um, as a result of some type of response activity. So, you know, when we talk about severity, we want to look at those components as it pertains to the organization. Now, let me ask you this, you know, and use the chat box if you like, you know, if you were called upon right now to have to respond to some type of crisis to your organization, how many of y'all would be comfortable uh, jumping in right today? And you can just, you know, yes or no, um, how, you know, how many of y'all would actually feel that you could do the job if called upon today? So that's one thing I'm going to talk about here. Um, I was kind of in a similar situation as a lot of individuals in the business continuity world. Things that happen outside of my control that really led to a um, uh, strong or 
Um, before I uh, came to academia at the University of Texas, Dallas, uh, I was a business continuity planner for Linux International. And Linux International is a large HVAC company. Um, they actually have a location in India. Um, they have a technology center in India. Um, and they are also uh, in several other countries. But one of the things that I was charged with was I was in charge with designing a business continuity team that's going to be able to respond in the event of a disaster. And when you have over 400 locations, um, you know, 300 locations uh, in the in, across the U.S. and the world in Canada and Mexico, it becomes very difficult to truly have a full grasp of how well your team can respond. And, of course, I did business continuity tabletops. I, I tested plans. Um, I did uh, training all the time. But the thing that I kind of realized looking back is you have to have some foundational strengths before the loss occurs. Without these foundational strengths, you really don't have the the right skill sets to be able to respond effectively. So one of the things we have are developed and practice plans. And if I were to we all have plans. I would imagine a lot of people would say, yes, we have plans and, you know, we've, we've uh, developed those plans. Uh, and maybe we can say, yeah, we practiced those plans. Um, but I will encourage you that plans are also kind of like fantasy documents in some ways because you don't really know how well those plans are going to work until something happens. And the closest thing we can do to actually testing our plans is to put in a tabletop and, and have, um, you know, leaders test whether or not they can respond to certain conditions, right? But I'll also tell you there's many times where you can test your plans that don't require the full tabletop. Anytime there is a major systems change and upgrade going on, maybe there's severe weather in the area. This is a great time to activate some of those plans and work through it. You know, it's it's always better to be able to test uh, an organization's ability to respond during times of low stress, because when high stress comes, if you don't have um, the autonomy that's needed to respond, you're not going to just to develop them in the crisis. The second thing that I really need to, to harp on is you got to have building records and diagrams and schematics for your things. We might have had for years, for 10, 20, 30 years, but do we still have all of the uh, diagrams and all of the parts and all of the, the information we need to be able to buy replacement parts for it or to design something new. Uh, more importantly, when we look at buildings, do we have the original diagrams that show the, the, the uh, architectural layouts? These type of things are kind of important um, when we're looking at the speed in which recovery can happen because if we have to go find or create new documents, um, it can create some problems with the response. The next thing is the implemented loss control um, recommendations. These are these are things that if you know something should be fixed, you got to work on getting that thing fixed, right? Um, many times we have to delay making certain types of repairs because the conditions um, may not be there financially. But there are workarounds, and coming up with a workaround sometimes is a solution um, to a financial problem. And finally, you got to have the established institutional knowledge, right? If you don't have institutional knowledge, then um, you're not going to have the, uh, the skill sets necessarily to respond. So this is what happened on July 19th of 2018 uh, in Marshalltown, Iowa, a EF3 tornado went right through the town. I remember this day really fondly because I remember exactly what I was doing when I found that the news a tornado had hit. Um, I was actually standing in line and I was buying groceries and I got a call from um, the assistant vice president of operations and his name is Bob and Bob called me and said Bob or he said Stephen Bob Marshalltown just got hit by a tornado. That was it. That's all I got. Uh, he didn't have any other information. Uh, and I said, okay, uh, I'm on my way back uh, to the office. 
I dropped off the groceries at the house and asked my wife. I said, hey, honey, Marshalltown just got hit by a tornado. I got to go back into the office. Um, and I stopped for a moment. She goes, she's like, hey, you need to go. And I realized I was wearing shorts and a T-shirt and flip-flops. And I said, should I change first? And she goes, no, they're just going to be glad to see. I went back and took all the chief legal officer and the chief public affairs officer and uh, operations people. Uh, and, you know, everyone kind of stopped and looked at me. And we had this moment of not really sure what to do here and uh, instinctively I knew I had to jump in. This isn't my first rodeo. Uh, I've been in many disaster scenes uh, in my career and so I kind of knew the the steps to, to go ahead and, and push through. But the fact is, is in that moment I realized that there was this condition that did everything I do leading up to this prepare the teams for the what they need to do? So when we look at this tornado, um, it was uh, it happened around 4:24 p.m. Uh, and it was EF3, so it was 144 miles per hour. It had a almost nine mile path length and 1,200 yards wide, and injured 22 people, no deaths. During this time, could not have been a more difficult time for the organization because we had shift change happening. So normally the operations folks, there's about 300 people during the, the morning shift and there's about 300 people in the evening shift. And during this time, we had 600 people inside that factory. Um, and, you know, they got early warning. They started seeking shelter around 345, 347, somewhere in there and then they the tornado actually hit right before the tornado hit our factory it made a turn in as you can kind of see um towards the very bottom of the the screen it made a jog down to uh that would be to the south and then to the east and it hit it hit uh the factory uh before dying now, when I say it hit the factory, I mean it literally went straight down the factory. That right there is a picture of a million square feet of factory. Um, it started in the very uh, top of the north side. You see there is where all the office buildings are, but our, um, our finished goods and, and uh, repair parts and all sorts of other stuff was kept. Um, you could not ask for a worse place for a tornado to hit, right? Because that is one continuous um, tunnel that was very critical to our operations. So this happened and, you know, I get a call and I'm back in. And I said, hey, I'm going to go out to Marshalltown. Uh, and I flew in with one other person, the vice president of operations. Um, and uh, we were there looking at this damage, and it was just overwhelming. Now, the picture on the left you see is over the heating section. And one thing you have to know is that was built in the 1930s and 40s. That section has these concrete panels that each weigh 600 pounds um, that had to come down, each one of those. And that was a very difficult process. They had to be brought down hand by hand. But more importantly, the thing you see up there is a whole lot of debris. And that debris was devastating. And painstaking removal of that debris took weeks. And the reason why is because there's commingled materials there. In the United States, we're not allowed to bury um, or we're not allowed to put asbestos materials together with non-asbestos materials. There has to be some type of uh, hazardous material process to store that to make sure it doesn't become um, you know, up in the air and things of that nature. As a result, this process right here was just really devastating. The picture on the right is where our national parts warehouse was. Um, if we built a product and we um, no longer produced that product, we had to still provide um, repair parts for that product um, so that people can have their equipment repaired. And we had one location that had all the parts, and that's where this part was. All of a sudden, we were no longer able to produce the parts we needed um, for some of the older models. And that becomes a challenge, right? 
But there's another thing that's down here. There is a critical gas area, and it's just to the left of the picture. You can't really see, you can kind of see where the fence is, but the critical gases, you don't realize how important critical gases are to a process until you're trying to bring the process back up and you realize, hey, I don't have any helium. I, I don't know how we're going to get this thing back going if we don't have a refrigeration reclaimer, things of that nature. You know, the plans are set in motion to help you prepare for an event and receive continuity plans as chess games because really a business continuity plan is a game of chess. It's not designed to tell you how to play the middle game or even how to end the game. It's only designed to tell you the first couple opening moves because what ends up happening is as you move forward with your business continuity recovery, you're going to find out there are things that the plan just cannot pick up. There are things that the plan was not prepared for. For instance, what do you do with all the employees that are no longer able to work, right? One of the things that we did, um, which I thought, um, looking back, it's, it's still one of the best things we could find out there, and we had to do layoffs. But one of the things that I negotiated with our contractors was for them to be hired back as contractors to work. And so people had an opportunity to, to recover money by working to help rebuild the factory they worked in. And that little step right there really helped um, build relationships, right? It really helped to keep uh, people engaged because if people are not engaged, they will leave your organization. They will not return. So if you go inside the factory, and if you remember that long arrow that I showed you, this is about halfway down the building, and it's looking towards the end of the, the building. And this is what I walked into. And this is, I could see skylight. I could see all of this loss here, right? Um, there's the ceiling tiles I was talking about, those, you know, four to 600 pound tiles that are just hanging there vicariously over equipment. You know, it's really difficult sometimes to know where to start when you're looking at recovery or in response, response and recovery. You know, where do you start? You know, one thing that was really um, kind of fortunate about this is, everything was impacted, the entire building. So I wasn't being pigeonholed into having to fix a specific area because it provided parts to all the other factories. And we knew that we had only so much lead time to get that information or to get that piece of equipment going. So when we look at business recovery, one of the things we have to identify is those critical pieces of equipment. I need to be able to, um, to get the operations up and going. You know, generally speaking, most organizations around 40 to 60% will never recover from a disaster, okay? Uh, 40 to 60% will never recover. It gets much worse when you go past seven days. About 92% of businesses will never recover once you go past seven days. So I knew that we had to get that piece of equipment up and running. And guess what? We did it on day seven. We got the most critical piece up and running on day seven. This is a just a, I think it's a 500 town uh, press. This is the, uh, what we call press row. And as you can see, it's completely exposed, right? Definitely not what you want to see. Now, this is something that's kind of funny about it looking back. Um, I'm the guy in the khaki pants in this picture. This is how my kids uh, call me um, when I'm out there on the road. And they said, Dad, you're famous. And I said, what do you mean I'm famous? They said, you're in the newspaper. And apparently some press photographer took a picture of me um, talking to the people in this picture. Now, looking back, this picture actually means a lot because I look at this picture and I see the guy in the red helmet. His name is Marcus. Marcus was my general contractor. He was my right-hand man. Um, he was doing so much for us. Uh, and the man in the orange vest to the right was Childress Engineering. It's um, It's... Uh, Tony Childress, who's the uh, principal engineer for Childress Engineering and the president. And these gentlemen were brought in with me. They, they showed up on the same plane as me to, to help. Day one, we had people on the ground ordering in stuff, uh, preparing um, plans and everything else to be able to start the recovery.
Schuler. He's wearing a blue uh, jeans and a blue shirt. John Schuler is uh, a, a member of the Linux team in Marshalltown and has been with the company for over 30 years. He's the environmental engineer. Um, and I will tell you that John uh, knew so much that you just could not have imagined the value of the knowledge. The average tenure of an employee at this facility was 20 plus years. That's one thing that I look at and I say, I wish more organizations had this. You know, the fact is, is when we ask people to step up during moments of crisis, we're not asking them to all of a sudden change everything they do. We're just asking them to do their job a little bit differently. And that's really what happened here. The story of Marshalltown isn't a success on a business continuity program. Um, I can't claim that. The success of Marshalltown starts with the heart and mission of the Marshalltown people. And the fact is, is when people feel like they need to fight for their, their, their organization, they will. Um, and that's, you know, one thing that we don't necessarily always see is the loyalty um, that we once had in a lot of uh, businesses these days. And I think that that's one thing we really need to encourage is more um, more focus on um, on helping people uh, bring their best selves and giving them the the roles and the skills to do their jobs, and more importantly, giving them the room to do their job. John ended up doing things that you know were not in his job description. But the fact is, is he had the skill sets. And this is one area I talk about in the paper that I wrote, um, is that we need to do a critical skills assessment. Find out what your employees can do. You know, most of the people in Marshalltown um, have farmlands. Um, a lot of them work as farmers and operate a, a forklift or to operate um, a, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, um, to do fencing, you know, things of that nature. It wasn't unreasonable for people to, to do things, um, but it was identifying those skill sets before that was really kind of the, the important piece. Now we had some challenges to this response. This was a large scale event, okay? Um, it went for several miles. There were logistic issues that we had to contend with, right? Marshalltown, Iowa was in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. It's 60 miles, um, uh, northeast of Des Moines, but it really isn't a huge area. Um, we had a lot of asymmetrical information, asymmetrical information meaning we didn't know what we didn't know. You know, you can only know so much and, and oftentimes you want to delay in making a decision until you get all the information and you can't do that. You know, um, I was told on day two um, that, you know, Stephen, you're just gonna have to make a decision. Uh, because someone's going to critique it down the road and tell you you did it wrong. But the fact is, is you don't have enough time to wait for that, uh, you know, to, to get the right answer. So you got to make a decision, live with it. And, you know, it's so true. So much of the challenge to response actually comes from delaying an action. You know, we have to make steps and we have to make decisions and we have to live with the consequences. There's not every, we're not going to know everything. Um, I truly do believe, though, in Ockman's Razor, which says that, you know, the simplest solution is oftentimes the most uh, efficient solution, right? Um, and so, you know, we don't have to overthink this. You know, um, I also encourage creative problem solving. If you don't have a clear understanding of what to do, bring in a couple of people, have a conversation and work it out. The fact is the power of three to four or five people working on a problem is so much greater than the power of one. Uh, other thing is this was a cascading disaster. And I'm going to talk about that here in a second. It's a cascading disaster because um, Iowa rains all the time. And in fact, Iowa is one of the only states in the United States that does not have to have in-ground irrigation. Most of the states have in-ground irrigation for agriculture. Iowa gets a ton of rain. And it just so happens that when this disaster happened, I will receive the most rainfall it ever had in the state's history. Uh, and we're going to talk even more about that. Uh, and, you know, fuzzy timelines. 
you don't know when recovery begins. Response and recovery are, you know, not so clearly understand. There's different things we have to do in response, and there's some things you have to do differently in recovery, right? Um, in a response, you're just trying to make everything safe to, to operate, right? You're just trying to get in there and make it safe to be in the building. In recovery, you're trying to put the building back together, right? Now, there's different conditions in how you respond. All right. So... I got to ask this question here, you know, so one of the things that I kind of have noticed about uh, disasters and deployments is that it's not always the same thing. You're not going to have is you can actually work on certain components of deployment. For instance, good communication. You know, um, I uh, work with a, a lot of students and uh, my students call me doctor or professor, um, but outside of the institution, I don't go by doctor. Uh, I just go by Steven. And the reason why is because when I look at disaster response and when I look at my consulting work and things of that nature, uh, it's important that I create a good open line of communication um, in that it's I'm not the person with all the answers. Uh, sure, I have a lot of answers, uh, but I don't have all the answers, and, and I need to rely on my team. Right? Second thing, I who exactly who I was bringing into the area because I had worked it out months before. You know, I worked out a plan of who I needed and what I needed, and, and all I had to do was pick up the phone and make one phone call, and the call tree activated, and we had people showing up. The next thing is having a core project management group. You need about three to five people who um, are critical to the operations, um, to getting things restored. You know, you need a person who's good with finance and tracking, so you need to have that numbers cruncher guy. But the other people it is you need an operations person, a person who truly understands the operations. You need a supply chain person, somebody who knows how to get the stuff to there. Right, you need a person who has the authority to sign the 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 uh, work orders and things of that nature, being able to approve, um, you know, spending things of that nature. You got to have that. Um, without these types of roles, you really are kind of limited in what you can do effectively. And you know, finally, I have to say is you have to have knowledge data or knowledge driven decision making. You know, you can't you can't rely on things being. Um, the way it was because once a disaster happens there is no return to normal there's just a new normal right and so some of the old ways just aren't going to work so you got to be prepared to move and, and pivot and come up with a new process to respond now this is us building that part seven days um, we worked under scaffolding. Um, scaffolding is not up in this picture yet because it showed up actually on day eight. Um, but, you know, we're working on a generator um, that's, you know, being powered by diesel that had to be refilled every day. Um, and we had a fuel truck that came through. And these are the guys who got that picture, uh, or those are, those are the guys who were there getting that first piece of equipment up. And that was a huge milestone. But see, what I look back on this, I understand that there were so many critical needs for the business and understanding those critical needs was imperative to how we respond. The other thing is, are you looking at a production focused loss or a building focused loss? Most of us are looking at a production focused loss, which means it's a business interruption claim. It's not a property claim. You know, the property can be put back to place. You don't need an entire building restored to get functional work going again. You know, when you shift your focus from a building to production, you actually can increase the effectiveness of your organization to respond. You got to have flexible work groups, right? You don't want to be tied down to the old ways um, if it's not if it's not productive. So being flexible is really important. And then creative problem solving. Cannot stress this enough. Enough. Creative problem solving is something that uh, has to be relied on during disasters because we don't really know how to respond truly. Now, this is uh, an idea that came up and was published in a paper I wrote uh, not that long ago. But the fact is, is, you know, there's really only one way to optimize your response and recovery. You got to have the right people, the right services, and the right equipment all there at the same time. But the problem is, and that's what the center of the circle is, is that's when we see optimization. Um, 
you know, if you don't have those things, you're never going to be able to be effective in responding. Now, I want to tell you this, those circles are always moving, right? They're not, they're not static, you know, they're dynamic, they're moving. And so it's always a moving target. And so this is one thing that you have to focus on is the continued efforts to optimize and recover. This is what the temporary wall looked like. So um, with the million square feet, I knew what we had to do is we needed to make it look like um, it was different buildings. It was just smaller buildings, right? And so we, we put up these scaffoldings and created temporary walls that could withstand up to 40 to 60 mile per hour winds. And this is how we began to work, you know? Uh, well, the water came. In fact, we had enough water coming in that um, we had to uh, have full and uh, water, water vacuum trucks. Uh, I think we had like four or six of them there 24-7 to suck the water up. Um, there's a whole nother story that I, I could tell you all about water mitigation, and maybe that's another conversation to have down the road. But the fact is, is we had enough water coming that we could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool 10 feet deep 50 times. Okay? An Olympic-sized swimming pool. So, you know... Um, pretty big pool, 10 feet deep, 50 times. That's how much water we had coming through. I nicknamed our facility uh, the Iowa Storm Water Management Plan. And it was just so happened that we had the right ideas and skill sets to be able to come up with this because we actually identified this before the loss happened. I actually had required the factory to do a flood mitigation plan um, a couple of months before this. And it just so happens that some of the steps from the flood mitigation plan were used in this response. Now I said it again, creative problem solving. This is a picture of how sometimes you just have to think differently, right? Um, inside this is a refrigeration reclaimer, um, which in the refrigeration process, uh, when you create a, um, an air conditioning unit, you have to put refrigerant into the system to charge the system. And you got to make sure you can hold a certain charge for a certain amount of time to make sure the system works. Well, then once you've done that, you have to remove the refrigerant back out. In our normal process, we had a refrigerant reclaimer. We didn't have that here. And so um, because it got lost uh, in the tornado. And so we had to use a smaller system. The smaller system kept overheating and it kept shutting down the operation line. Every two hours, the operations line would shut down. And we realized that, hey, there's got to be a workaround. So we started thinking and someone said, well, why don't we just put an air conditioning, a wall unit on it? So we went out to Walmart and we bought a wall unit and we put a box in and we installed this and we had this thing running at uh, 70 degrees, I think. Um, and the thing never shut down again. You know, sometimes you just have to think outside the box to make things work. So this is um, seven days, uh, or excuse me, three weeks, seven days later, we built our first unit. The first unit we kept is actually in a museum at um, the and that was a really important thing because we believe in community um, development and giving and things of that nature and you know this was one of the high points of my life when I looked at um, the near impossible to get units restored in less than a month we had hired everyone back within a month so we laid off you know 600 people we hired them back within a month and guess what by the fifth week, we were, we were actually hiring for new people because we needed more people to work. So, um, you know, on the 16th of August, uh, we produced our first unit. Six days later, we built 601 units, um, and we got, we got things going again. So this is what the picture looked like at the very beginning uh, that I showed you. And let me show you what it looked like 12 weeks later. So 12 weeks later, we had, you know, 50% of our factory, 60% of our factory up and running in some type of normal capacity. There was much we couldn't do. We were still running on generators. Um, but this was a huge accomplishment um, when you look back and you think about all the things that we faced. Um, but the fact is, is the people in Marshalltown were not just sit, going to sit back and let things happen to them. They were active in 
and responding to the things, right? So that's why I talked in the very beginning that the old, mo the conventional model of risk um, and hazards assessments, we need to kind of rethink that because we're not this passive being. We're active agents in an active system, and we have the ability to reduce some of the severity and consequences of these losses. Um, this is what, um, before the Marshalltown tornado, this is actually the assessment uh, that I created using that model that um, I talked a little bit earlier. And guess what? You know, tornado and flood were the two things that I said were probably going to be the most significant events in the, the factory. And sure enough, it was. Um, the next more significant event is wildfire. There's a whole bunch of land all around um, this factory, and it's all farmland. Uh, so if they had a dry season, they could theoretically have a big wildfire event, right? And that would be detrimental. But, you know, doing this and doing these assessments, you know, we have to do them, um, right? I mean, we, we, we have to do them at least annually. But how about we look for more meaning in these assessments? Let's, let's think about how we can create better business continuity programs around these types of assessments, right? Um, so lessons learned, uh, we learned to digitize our electronics archives. Um, we identified our interdependencies and uh, did an operational needs assessment, continue to promote uh, loss control recommendations and collaboration projects. And that is it. Well, I'll go ahead and hand it back over to you to conclude this meeting then. Sure, thank you, Dr. Stephen. Thank you all for attending this session. Hope the session was informative and fruitful. We would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Stephen for this session. May I request everyone to switch on their camera for a few seconds to take a group photograph? Thank you. Uh, thank you all. And we will be sharing the session recording link with you. And uh, we look forward to have you in our upcoming sessions. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Steven.